All right, um, Admiral Howe gave you a little sense of Carl's biography uh, this morning. Just a question, how many of you have read either Matterhorn or What It Is Like to Go to War, Carl's two books? Okay, that's a pretty good representation. Um, I first saw Carl on the uh, Bill Moyers show, and that's an excellent interview. Uh, Carl told me last night that it was up for uh, an Emmy, I think. Uh, that, yeah. that, that specific episode was up for an Emmy because it was such a good interview. Um, Carl is really a quite remarkable guy. He is uh, a graduate of Yale. He, uh, as, uh, as Admiral Howe said, he had a Rhodes Scholarship, which he voluntarily left to command a Marine uh, infantry platoon in, uh, in the worst of Vietnam. Uh, went on to have a business career, and then decades later starts doing some quite bizarre things that he recounts <laughs> quite honestly and graphically in his book, and realizes he's, he's got some problems uh, um, with, with what war has done to him. And so he got the help he needed, but also, uh, being the superbly educated man that he is, he began to turn this into uh, these remarkable books. Um, and I don't know really any war memoir that's written by someone who experienced the worst of combat and has the deep educational resources to really think deeply about what war did to him uh, that Carl has. So if you haven't read uh, the books, um, uh, I highly recommend that you do it. Um, and uh, I don't think you'll ever forget them, though they're uh, books like no other. Um, the closest thing I can think of is like it in a way is J. Glenn Gray's book about World War II called The Warriors. Uh, this guy got his PhD in philosophy and his draft notice on the same day and went off to, to World War II and wrote a, an excellent book about uh, World War II. But it, he was an intel guy. He wasn't in hard combat. Uh, it was a, it's a much more distant kind of reflection. So since I first saw Carl on Moyers, uh, he, this is now Carl's fourth trip to visit us. Um, and he's always preferred this format. So um, some of the questions are somewhat similar. If any of you have watched this on YouTube, but I worked pretty hard to come up with some novel things and got some, a couple of insights from colleagues uh, to try to modify them too. So we'll go through a few questions and then we'll still have plenty of time for you to ask him your own questions. And if you've got the books, he'll be happy to autograph them if you bring them up after, yeah. after the end of the session. So one important theme throughout your book, what it is like to go to war, is the uh, great difficulty of having an honest conversation between veterans mm -hmm. and civilians about the experience of war and its effects. You write about this a lot in your book, but for this audience, would you tell them what do you think are the sources of this, these inhibitions on both sides? Yes. Um, fear uh, uh, on both sides is one of the, of, the, of the biggest ones, which is that the returning veteran is afraid that they'll be judged uh, because the things that you do in war often end up being horrible. And uh, you're worried that uh, somebody who actually hasn't seen the context in which uh, these deeds are performed, and then you start to relate them to them, they're just going to judge you. I mean, you, nobody wants to be thought of as a horrible person. And so you think, well, if there's a chance of that, maybe I'll just keep quiet. Um, on the other side, the civilian side, people are afraid, oh, I don't want to disturb him, or I don't want, to, I don't want her to get upset. Uh, as a culture, we're pretty bad dealing with emotions. And uh, if you're going to have an honest dialogue with a, with a returning veteran, you had better be prepared to have some emotions coming out. Because uh, anywhere from, from anger to sorrow to pride, um, all of the above in about a 30 second interval. Uh, and often people say, well, you know, I'll, I'll talk to somebody. Uh, and they'll say, oh, I don't want to talk about it. So you're rejected. Well, there's another issue, it's rejection. You have to just have the courage to go back and talk again. Um, there's a deeper issue, which is that there's an automatic us-them that is a result, in my opinion, of an unconscious attitude on the part of the country. Uh, it comes in large part because we no longer uh, draft people, and so we we're beginning to see a, 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 a bigger uh, split between the military, a professional group. Uh, when I was a kid, I mean, everybody's dad and uncle had been in World War II, and 
every mother in town knew that a destroyer was, you know, smaller than an aircraft carrier, and things we, the, the, our, I just took for granted. When I wrote Matterhorn, the re, first people that were reviewing it said, well, no one knows what a M16 is, you better explain it. You know, I go, huh, how can that be possible? It is possible. I, I, I had this woman come up to me in, in a reading, and um, she was a little bit sort of nervous, you know, and I thought, well, I was going to, Finally, she comes up to the place where she wants the book sign, and um, I say, well, you know, what's going on? And she says, well, you know, I, I, I was a college student during the Vietnam War, and I just, I just hated it. I mean, it was just a terrible thing, and I, I went to all the protests I could, and I just didn't like it. And, and, uh, and then I read Matterhorn, and I didn't know you guys slept outside. <laughs> Do we have an issue? Yeah. And, where this, where this comes from, it, 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 I use this analogy, and, I, and, and I've used it before, so forgive me if you've already heard it, but it's a good one, so I'll use it again. Um, there's this rifle, and the rifle is paid for by taxes, and everybody in the country that pays taxes contributes to that rifle, and it's designed by scientists who are taught by second grade school teachers their arithmetic, who are fed by farmers, and it's built in factories, and you see where I'm going with this. So you have this enormous chain of connected events that builds this weapon. But at the end of that whole chain, some 19-year-old Marine pulls the trigger. He did the killing. The minute that you have an unconscious, and it's unconscious, I'm not saying people are bad, but, but it is an unconscious attitude that we didn't do the killing. He did the killing. So the minute that the veteran and the civilian have to start talking, there's already a, an unconscious division between the two of them. If people realize that we were all involved in this war and this returning veteran was at the other end of the, of the rifle, um, but we were at war, it's automatic, it's already a different dialogue instead of you're coming back after you've done the killing. <laughs> I got one other point, and this I think is really important. And on the part of veterans, there's this sort of, you don't know what I know. It's a sort of a cocky disdain, and I have to watch it in myself. Um, you civilians, you're just ignorant, you don't have a clue or a little bit of anger, you don't really know how much I suffered, or all that stuff. And that's a sort of a, a barrier, too. And, and I, I see you know, a lot of cocky kids coming back from wars, and that's hard to break down, too, so it's gotta be watched. Do you think it's worse with an all-volunteer force than it was with a draftee force? Well, That last <laughs> phenomenon you're describing? You know, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that uh, that cockiness is, is, is something that comes out of surviving co uh, combat. I mean, that's just, that, that is going through a fire and coming out the other end. Um, and I think that it doesn't have anything to do with whether you got drafted or whether you volunteered. Um, I, just, I just think it's, a, it's human nature and you just need to watch it because it really wasn't up to you that you went to combat. I mean, yeah, you volunteered for the military, but you could have been, you know, stationed in Germany. I mean, the orders gods are where they are. So you just have to kind of have a little more humility about it. Related to that first question, um, Anthropologists distinguish between guilt and shame. Mm. Um, shame refers to a deep sense of a loss of self-respect or almost a, I can't show my face, mm -hmm. a sense that others will think ill of you in some fundamental, almost existential way. Yeah. Whereas guilt is you know, uh, feeling badly about some specific thing that you did that yeah. requires expiation or forgiveness or yeah. something like that. Um, how much of what you experienced as you I started running into your issues after the war was guilt, and how much of it was shame? Mm -hmm. That's a nuanced question, isn't it? Um, you know, I, here, here's what, what comes to my mind. Um, guilt is, when, is a feeling that you have because I think you haven't owned it. I think that that's something that we, we do in place of owning it. I mean, I, I, I had this feeling of, of uh, you know, I may have done something wrong when I, when I ordered a kid to uh, uh, set an ambush and I got mad at him because he was slow and um, he wasn't getting there on time and so I was shouting out on the radio and he broke cover and, he, and his squad got hit by two RPGs and he died. And so I, there was this vague feeling of guilt, remorse that I had with that. And um, 
one day I finally just, it, it was, a, it was an, a, an experience that I had uh, that I wrote about in the, in the novel, a, a Mass for the Dead, that uh, people say either you're, you're, you're on the spiritual path or you're crazy, Marlantis. So I mean, I, I tried to choose the other one, but, uh, but as a result of that, and, and getting in that kid's skin, realizing what he was doing, I owned it. It's just like I got bloodthirsty. I got bloodthirsty. I owned it. And then I, don't, I wasn't feeling as guilty about it anymore because I just accepted that I'd, I, I, had, I had failed myself and the result was, was horrible. Um, shame is, is, a, is a more difficult thing because it's, I hadn't violated any kind of an ethical code Say with that with that example, I, I I got bloodthirsty and God, you know, Marines are supposed to be bloodthirsty. I mean, that's that's kind of what you know. We were trained to go get the enemy, and and he wanted to kill him too, and you know, all that sort of stuff. So I didn't feel as bad. But the one that I feel bad about is we we had premeditated uh, not taking any prisoners. Uh, a, a very iconic Marine was killed, and so revenge was in the air. And uh, I was I was really young. And I didn't stop it, and uh, I, in fact, participated in it. And when we took this hill, we shot every one of them down. They didn't have a chance to surrender. Uh, and um, everybody said, well, war is hell, and all that sort of stuff. As you know, I think that we, we can be better than that. And so the feeling that I have from that is that I fell short of my own standards, and I carry that with me. And again, the only solution to it is you just have to own it. Am I owning it right now? I've owned it before. I wouldn't have been able to talk to it. And uh, can I use a swear word here? Sure. You just have to, when you screw up like that, it's done. You have messed it up. You have done it. You have messed it up. And there's only one thing you can do. You just have to say, ah, shit. And say it out loud to yourself. Because then you go like, you accept it. And, and you're, you're not perfect. Part of guilt and shame is that somehow you could have been better. Uh, yeah, you should have been better. That's the ethical position. But I wasn't perfect. I'm still not perfect. And I screwed up. Oh, shit. I wish I hadn't have done that. And I won't do it again. The discussion you have in uh, what is like to go to war of the experience of killing in combat is um, nuanced and I think articulates some things that are very rarely articulated clearly. Uh, in particular, you give voice to what you call the unique pleasures of killing. Mm. Does that connect, you think, to your discussion of the Jungian psychological concept of the shadow in each of us? Oh, yeah. um, that you, um, and uh, that you talk about so eloquently. What's the, what's the connection there? Well, the shadow, the Jungian concept of the shadow is, is it's repression. It's it's parts of yourself that you don't like, and you press it down inside of you. It, it, it's hidden in your own psyche. You don't want to admit it. Um, you know, it's like it's like if you're a little bit pudgy and overweight, and, you, and, and then you go around saying, "Oh, these fat people are lazy." I mean, that's that, it's it's actually just you, you 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 feel bad about yourself, but you're not conscious of it, so you throw it out there. And um, when it comes to killing. We are not the top animal on the food chain because we're nice. We are a savage, fierce primate. There is just no doubt about it. And I think genetically, we, we evolved to hunt. And it would be species enhancing to have a thrill from hunting. And, uh, and there's no doubt about it that, that when, you're, when you're in on the kill, and I think if it was when 50,000 years ago, or if you're in on a kill in combat, this comes up. It's, it's genetic, it's, it's, it's in us. And uh, we, just as you have to recognize the shadow, you have to recognize this part of being a human animal. Um, it's like sexuality. If people start to rep try to repress sexuality, like, oh, we're pure, we're all angels, we don't, uh, uh, I don't have needs, or all the different things, uh, even, the, even the, putting it in terms of whether you're, you're an angel or not, putting moral things on something that's just purely physical, biological. You get Victorian uh, society where, you know, they cover the legs of pianos because, you know, this was, this was something that we had to watch. And all that is is repression. 
the same thing goes with aggression. This, this, we just have to recognize it. And the issue is, and this is the issue for leadership, is you have to be able to understand that when that happens and that thrill happens, then you've got to say, okay, it, you know, B.B. King, the thrill is gone. You've got to stop. You've got to come back. You've got to come back to this reality. But it, you can't do that unless you first recognize it's down inside of you. People who say, I could never do that, I, I think they're dangerous because I think they very well could do it if, 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 if push came to shove. And I certainly did, and I own. I, it was thrilling. It's like crack cocaine. Uh, if you say to a kid, well, you know, you're not going to get high off of this. It's all going to be bad. I mean, they know you're lying. But the costs, the costs of crack cocaine, that's where you focus. But don't deny the other side. This isn't one of the questions I wrote down, but you, you described this one scene where you're calling in an airstrike in a valley, and you talk about the, the power that you experienced in that moment. Uh, uh, could you talk about that a little too? I, mean, I know I'm throwing this at you out of the blue. But. Well, you know, I mean, I think that the incident you're talking about was a friend of mine who was an A4 pilot, a yeah. carrier pilot. But, uh, but I've had that same experience because I, I ended my tour being a, 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 an air observer, forward air controller. So that sense of power, I mean, we all aspire to a sort of a godlike state and, and you know people people are always trying to sort of you know be rock stars i mean what, how wonderful is that well what's above that well you know you could be thor you could spew thunder and fire down on people and it's 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 almost you could say it's childish but you could also say it's just primitive power i mean this friend of mine said that he, he flew into a valley in North Vietnam and he hit it with napalm and he lit up the entire valley and he felt fantastic about it. Think about what you can do with, with jet aircraft. And I think that it's, this, it's exactly the same kind of thing. If you don't own that, that there's something thrilling about lighting up a whole valley and burning it down, then I think you're dishonest. I, I, you know, maybe, at least I, I would be, I'd be dishonest because I did like it. And, and uh, there's something about it that, is, that made you feel really powerful. Uh, it's a false power. I mean, you know, we don't have A4s when we drive to work, you know. Uh, so you have to get, get that into context. But uh, again, I think that what I'm arguing for is to be psychologically honest, recognize these things. And you can choose to ride the horse or you can let the horse run away from, with itself. And these emotions, these primitive parts of us, are the horse that we ride. We're born into this world and we have to ride this horse called our body and our emotions and our, our genetic sort of uh, dispositions. And the issue is are you in control and are you riding it? And you can't be in control of that horse unless you recognize where it is and how to control it. Um, decades after the events of the war, he described driving down highway, no. 101 and 19, whenever it was in California, five. five. Um, and you see before you the eyes of a Vietnamese soldier that you killed in, right. in your windshield. Um, you just listen to the country radio driving through yeah. Central California. Yeah. Can you talk about that experience? What sure. do you think it says about your mental and spiritual state, and why that guy in particular? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have, I, I, there's a couple things that, that lead up to this, and, and um, one of them is that in combat, you very rarely see and connect with the person that you kill. I mean, most of our armed forces, in fact, do it at considerable distances. Even the infantry, it's quite often, uh, certainly in Vietnam, there would be lead flying all over the place in, in a firefight. And you wouldn't see anything and just be, you know, you're dead and they're dead when it was over because it's obscured by jungle. Uh, but even a little bit of distance. I was in a, in a situation, oh, the second thing is, is that the reason that you can do this, kill up front and personal, or even kill at, at a distance, is that you, uh, I, I use the word pseudo-speciate your enemy. Um, Talhead, Haji, Gook. Kraut, nip, da da da. You know, we have lots of words for for our enemies, and uh, 
sort of the, the more, you know, uh, people who actually don't understand what, what military people do say, oh, this is horrible, you're objectifying people. If you've been raised to be a good Christian Judaic citizen of this country, uh, thou shalt not kill is one of the, one of the primal ethical uh, lessons that you imbibe and you incorporate. How do you pull the trigger if, if you're not supposed to kill somebody? Well, you kill a towelhead. You kill a haji. You don't kill a person. And that is not something that I think is bad in the moment of combat. I don't think you can get the job done if you don't do it that way. I, I don't think you can. Question is, as soon as it's over, what are you doing? And if you don't get out of it, you get Milai and you get Abu Ghraib, you get problems. In this particular case, I was uh, on an assault, and, um, and just as somebody was saying here, it's like, you, you know, you can have the plan, but unless the, all the people down at the absolute bottom level know what, what is required, what the plan is, it's chaos. And we were in the chaos phase, and so I, I, we had already broken through a line of bunkers, and there were some holes above us, and it was a very steep hill. And I, I had uh, three guys with me that just had happened to collect, I, my radio man and me, and then there was a, uh, a couple other Marines uh, because everybody was going crazy and I was trying to organize them. And, and people who have been in, in combat and infantry understand that phase of the battle. Uh, and I saw two chai comms coming down. Those are those potato masher hand grenades. And, and I, 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 could, I always still remember them coming through the air sort of end over end like that, and they blew up, and, and one of them knocked me out, and, and I lost my sight for a while, I was unconscious, but uh, came to very quickly, and um, so we all got our grenades and threw them back up there, and then two more chai comms came down, and we were scrambling to go up underneath them, because what we were hoping is that when they'd come down, they'd fall behind us and then go down the hill below us, so we were trying to go up, but of course, the higher we went, the closer to the grenade throwers we would get. And then they came again, and we threw again, and finally the lieutenant's brain kicks in, and it's like, we're gonna be out of grenades on the next throw here in Marlantis, so we better do something else. And so I said to the two guys, we, one, of, one of us had gone down, um, and I said, okay, I'm gonna go around to the side, and uh, when they stand up to throw their grenades, uh, you throw your grenades, and when they stand up to throw them back, I'll be in position to get them with my M16. So I crawl around the, the, the side, and I get to a, a position, and I'm laying down on the ground. And uh, our two grenades come sailing up, and I could see these two NVA soldiers in a, in a fighting hole, and one of them was already dead. Our two grenades hit, and uh, this kid, NVA soldier, probably about 18, same as all, all of the Marines that were with me, stands up and we lock eyes. Now that is really rare. I mean, I'm no further away from him in the front row and I've got him in the sights of my M16. And he looks at me and I look at him and we connect, this is not an animal. This is not a goop, this is a kid, a kid with a hand grenade in his hand. And uh, I can remember whispering to him saying, because I couldn't speak Vietnamese, another issue about where we go and fight our wars with people who don't know, can't stand out like sore thumbs, but I, 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 I kept whispering, don't throw it, I won't pull the trigger. Don't throw it, I won't pull the trigger. And he just snarled at me and threw it, and I pulled the trigger, and, and I killed him. The, the first thing that is very interesting about that, about me, and I think that people should try and get this, is that what did you feel when you killed him? Well, what happened is that I anticipated the recoil on the M16 and I bucked a little bit, it's called bucking your shot, and so the, the, the end of the barrel def goes down just a little bit. So I hit the lip of the hole he was in and it, it sprayed the lip of the hole and then went, went into his chest. So what, what I thought when I killed him, you bucked your shot. And I, and I mean, you know, Marine rifle instructors kick you if you buck your shot, you know, I mean, they walk around the line, it's like, you know, they, I bucked my shot. I didn't think of anything. I didn't think of anything other than that. And he was gone and that grenade went off just next to me and, and I was fine. Um, and and uh, we had to get ready for the counterattack, and we still had holes to take. And so I didn't think anything of it other than that. I bucked my shot. 20 years later, 
I'm riding down I-5 in the little bubble of country music all by myself. I mean, I've got five kids and, you know, two o'clock in the morning by yourself in a car is really a luxury. And uh, <laughs> the, these eyes appeared in the windshield. Uh, now, I'm sophisticated enough to know, you know, this is not a ghost out there on the highway, but I just thought, it's my unconscious saying, you haven't dealt with this. I didn't. I bucked my shot. I was busy. I didn't think about it at all. I didn't think about it for 20 years. And then up it comes, and I'm going like, oh, I think you need to deal with this. And that's what I was talking about a couple of questions ago. I had to own I killed a human being. Now, I don't kick myself about that. I killed lots of human beings. I mean, he wasn't the only one. It's just that he was the one that I killed when I knew he was. The rest of them were more abstract, uh, as I'm sure some of you understand. But that one I had to own. I had to understand it. I had to deal with it. And uh, I wrote that book, you know, what it's like to go to war, motivated in large part by trying to understand that. And uh, again, the only advice I can give you is that, yeah, that happened. Don't try and hide from it. Uh, a friend of mine identified it really well. He said, he said, Carl, ghosts haunt you. They're inside of you, and they haunt you, and they make you do really weird things. And I was doing weird PTSD things. And uh, you need to turn your ghosts into ancestors. And um, what, what, what he meant by that was that you just, it, it, your ancestors are part of you as well. I mean, who I am is a person that killed this kid on some hill in, in Vietnam and a whole lot of other things. But that's, I can't get rid of that. I can't say I'm not that person. But as long as it was a ghost, it was haunting me. When I started writing about it and got honest about it and got it out in front of me, I own it. I still did the killing, but it's out here now. It doesn't haunt me. And there's lots of ways you do that. You talk to people, you can do poetry, music. I mean, the arts are amazingly good for it. Psychotherapy is good for it. Uh, it. The process of getting the ghost out into an ancestor, still owning it, but no longer haunting you. And uh, that's what that book was about. You talk about going to war as entering the Temple of Mars, and you, the book starts with an account of you as a young boy hearing some uh, Boy Scout leaders around the fire who were mm -hmm. vets talk about their own experience, and at some level, thinking as a young boy, I, I definitely want to go to that temple, that's where I mm -hmm. prove my manhood and so forth. Um, but you also reflect a great deal on the fact that we don't do a really good job realistically preparing people to enter the temple. Um, our current chief of naval operations has stressed toughness as a core attribute that we need to cultivate in our training. Do you have any th thoughts about how we would consciously work on building toughness to prepare people to enter the Temple of Mars? Mm. I, I'd use a different word. Um, I, would, I would use resiliency. Toughness sort of implies, first of all, a defensive sort of, I can take it kind of an attitude. And, uh, and it's also, it also implies more rigidity than I would, I would want to sort of inculcate. I'm thinking more that, that what, what you really want is, is not toughness, but, but constant, steady, I won't quit aggressiveness. And uh, that kind of toughness. Uh, that, so that if it doesn't work this way, it's, it, it's like water. You, you're, I mean, think about this country. I mean, the unbelievable resources we have, the economic power, the, 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 the weaponry, and, and it's just like this, this, this water that just keeps coming and coming, and you're the person that has to keep it going so that if you get stopped here, you come out here, you get stopped there, you come out there. How do we t teach people to be constantly doing things like that so that the enemy just finally says, here he is again. Here they are. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, I, we just got through fighting them, and I thought we beat them, and now they're coming this way at us. Now they're coming this way. Constant pressure, and that's hard. That requires unbelievable uh, discipline and stamina because the thing is, if you win the battle, what you want to do is relax, you know? But if you really want to win the war, that's when you keep the pressure on the enemy and you keep going, you keep going. You read your military history, how many times opportunities are lost because we don't have that kind of toughness? And how do you develop that? Well, 
I think that, you know, I mean, Marine Boot Camp does a pretty good job at that. I mean, it's like you, uh, you go up this hill uh, with full pack and you'll be exhausted. Oh, gee, uh, somebody just tripped you. <laughs> well, it was a DI, you know, why did he do that? You know, because he, he wants you to get up and go at it again. And then, and then they'll make you do it when it's raining. And, you know, doing exercises like that, instead of saying, well, let's, let's schedule it at such and such, you should, you, you should do training exercises when it's snowing and it's miserable. And, and the constant, constant effort is, becomes inculcated in you. It becomes part of, of who you are. And so I think that, that this kind of training with the idea of relentlessness is what, what I would say is, is, is about toughness. I think of the Finns in the Winter War, and I am part Finn, so I'm, you know, but that the Russians couldn't believe it. I mean, they, they had overwhelming power on them. And, and the Finns would just keep coming at them. I mean, they were just like, I mean, when did these people quit? Well, they never did quit. That's the, that's the, that's the kind of thing that I would call toughness. Just an aside, have you ever seen the wonderful little movie about that, Fire and Ice? About I've the, never about seen about that. About the Finnish no. War? It's, yeah. it's very good. I mean, um, I know you had one combat tour and then you left the Marines, but many in this room have experienced multiple deployments over mm -hmm. many years. How do we deal with military personnel who had those multiple combat tours, especially as many of them now are re returning or perhaps going to garrison for the first time? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's a sort of the, the, the meta level, which is you know, shorter wars and more people to fight them. Um, that would solve a, quite a bit of that problem. Uh, but since that's not in our power to do, I, I, would, I would think that the first thing that I would do is, is I would make it make mandatory counseling. I mean, there is this stigma. You know, I'm, I don't want to go to the shrink. I mean, you know, I'm fine. It's okay. And I'd make it for the families as well. Now, okay, that means more, more resources. You do the math. Somebody could probably see 30 Marines or sailors in a week. Okay, that means you're going to have to have, you know, five for every, every company. You're going to have to go out with big contracts to, to get people that are skilled in this, but it's not going to last forever. But I think that that's the first thing I would do is I would, I would make, make it mandatory that you just go. The, the Israeli army has a, has a psychiatrist at the battalion level, just like we have a battalion surgeon. Uh, they have a battalion surgeon and a psychiatrist. And there's no stigma about going, it's like, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm, my stomach, stomach's upset, go see the surgeon. It's like, I'm feeling a little crazy, go see the psychiatrist. I mean, it, they don't have this sort of stigma. It's just like, you know, we, we need help either way. And I think that's one thing. The other thing is I think a little extra training. Uh, I think the corpsmen uh, and, and army medics, you could give them just two more weeks of stuff to start to, to see signs. It's like, you know, if, if you're trained, you can pretty soon start to see if someone's getting suicidal and you can get it faster. It wouldn't take very much more training to do things like that. And the other thing is I think that there should be places, ritualistic spaces, and I don't mean that you're going to have people beating on drums and doing sweat lodge stuff, but our, our quote, more primitive ancestors did have these ritualistic spaces. Warriors would come back and they would sit by a fire and talk, or they would go into sweat lodges. And, and I've been through one of those. You get, I mean, I thought I was going to die. And the reason that they do that is because you get reborn. And it's a psychological transformative <laughs> thing. We can do the 21st century version of that simply by having places where it's safe to talk. Uh, and, it's, and it's OK. I mean, just place where people listen. I mean, maybe you could do something like uh, on Veterans Day. Uh, you just, this place is going to be open, and all, all veterans that want, want to can go there and just everybody gets five minutes. Nobody's going to say a thing. They're just going to listen. I mean, we can do things that, we, that are simple, really simple, um, like that. And I think it, uh, it would help a lot. So related to Lenny's talk this morning, you have an entire chapter in your book dealing with lying. And yeah. you give some wonderful examples. I was examples. trying to revise in my mind, oh my God. <laughs> you have some great examples where you lied and you clearly feel you did the right thing in doing so. I mean, one of them involves this machine gunner, P-Dog, and his marijuana cigarette, and another involves lying over the radio about the effects of naval gunfire when you were flying as a forward air mm -hmm. controller. Could you briefly tell those stories and explain why, in your mind, those were clearly justified yeah. pieces of lying? All right. Like I said, now uh, the, I heard uh, people talking about this morning. I was going over my mind. So are they still justified? Or are they still? Because these these are gray areas. They're hard, you know. But I still think I was all right on these. Um, uh, 
the, the first one is, uh, uh, I, was, I was flying in an old one, Charlie, and uh, we had a cruiser offshore, and uh, we were right up on the Ben High River, and I happened to glimpse something uh, that I thought, that might be a bunker. And so we, we pulled, pulled in and came down low to the ground, and sure enough, we took fire. And I didn't have any artillery batteries around, and, and there was this beautiful cruiser right offshore. And so I, I contacted this cruiser, and I said, you know, I've got a target for you here. Now, naval guns are not like howitzers. They have a very flat trajectory, and these are bunkers. They're not, you know, this, we're not talking about the guns of Navarone here. We're talking about log things dug into the ground, okay? It doesn't lend itself well to naval gunfire. But these guys got on station and, uh, and started firing away, and I was directing it, and, and they were all over that bunker. I mean, it, the comp it was a complex. And uh, after the smoke cleared, we went in. <laughs> we still took fire with automatic weapons. And I got out, and the, someone was on the radio wanting the, the damage assessment. And I said, well, you guys did a great job. I mean, you hit it with everything you had. You were right on target. But uh, I'm sorry, you didn't get any bunkers destroyed, but you sure blew away all the camouflage. I've got some phantoms coming up from Da Nang, and we're going to take care of it from there. Uh, th there was this sort of long pause. We didn't destroy any bunkers, over. I said, no, you didn't, but, but that's great. It's, it's ab absolutely in the wide and the open. They're, they're toast. I mean, it's going to happen. We're, we got these phantoms coming. Uh, and I said, I'm out of here. I'm low on fuel. I got to get back. And so we, we, we turned away. We were raiding into another air, air, uh, fact to come up with these phantoms to help direct them. And, and um, I get another call, and the, guy's, the guy is, uh, clearly another a higher officer of some kind and he says can you can you just please check again and i'm going like why what's the, what's the story and then i start thinking well they have, haven't probably had a fire mission for weeks and it's like you know they just shot up a whole lot of ammo maybe they need to justify it so i talk to the pilot and he says oh god okay so we go back and we go on, across a bunker complex and i'm looking to see if they got anything and they didn't I mean, it wasn't their fault, but we took fire again, and I, and I called him, I said, we're out of fuel now, and I said, we gotta get out of here, I'm sorry. No damage, but great job, I mean, we'll get them later. We're mm, heading south, and uh, uh, this, this, I can't remember the, the call sign, but it was something like, this is Skipjack 6. Well, that's the captain, you know, of a cruiser, and he, I'm, a, I'm a lieutenant, right, Marine lieutenant. And so now I'm going, oh my God, the heavies are involved here, and, and it was like, Basically, he called us cowards. He said, you're not, you're not going back there and you're not seeing the real damage that we just did and uh, I'm gonna report you to your commanding officer for Daryl. I mean, he was out of line, you know? But clearly, he wanted a, a damage assessment. So I, I, uh, I just you know, turned him off and I talked to the pilot and we didn't even turn around. And I said, okay, and then I waited about 10 minutes and I called in. 83 meters of trail destroyed and seven bunkers. So I just made it up. And um, the justification was I didn't want to die and I didn't want the pilot to die for something that was silly because it wasn't going to do anything to help the tactical situation. The bunkers were open. We had jets coming up to take care of it. There was not going to be any intelligence uh, 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 advantage for my damage assessment being a, a lie or being just what it was, which was zero, which they didn't accept anyway. And uh, so my justification was that, that this guy wanted, that wanted a lie, and he wanted it because it would make his career better. And I just said, that, I'm not going to die for that. And I still, I still think it, it was a good idea. <laughs> um, but it, there's the shades of gray in there because, you know, uh, uh, he was a, a, a superior officer and he ordered us to go back and I just disobeyed the order. Um, you can't really have a military if people just choose to disobey orders. I, I get that. And that's why it becomes shades of gray. I mean, what's good for the whole organization and makes sense is in this particular situation didn't make much sense, didn't do any good. The, um, the other incident was, to me, a, a little more clear cut, and it was a much more a clear lie. Um, I had a machine gunner, I call him P-Dog, 
And uh, his name was Warner, and he called him Worm. It was his real name, but I just didn't use the real name of the book. And, and uh, he, he, had, he, had, he had been wounded twice. He was a fabulous machine gunner, 19-year-old kid from uh, North Carolina and, and uh, African-American and, and uh, you know, the, with the noose around his neck and I mean the whole yard. I mean, these, I, I love these kids because they just were, they, they were who they were. And he was like about three days short of rotating and he had been wounded and so he was sent back to the rear and I had just been sent back to the rear about a week ahead of him. And I'm on duty that night and um, get a call about one in the morning from the duty uh, NCO of another battalion. He says, I got, I got three of your guys here and uh, we, got them, we got them smoking marijuana. And I went, oh God, all right, you know, I mean, I'd been in college just a, you know, a year before, I mean, sm smoking marijuana, that, what's that, no big deal. It's legal in Oregon and Washington now, but then automatic uh, time in Portsmouth Naval Prison, automatic dishonorable discharge. So I thought, well, I got to go pick him up. So I, the duty sergeant and I get in the Jeep, and we head over to this other battalion's area, and there's these three kids squatting with their hands on a bench, and this gunnery sergeant standing over them. And he says, I've searched our T-U-R-D-S, and um, these are yours, so you, you search them. And I said, okay, I'll take care of it, Gunny. And I herd them into the, into the Jeep, and I drove off, and I said to the driver, I said, I really have to pee. I looked back at these guys in the back of the Jeep, and he said, oh, yes, sir, I think that's a great idea. So we stopped the Jeep, and we, we got out of it, and we both stand by the side of the road, and there's a scrambling going on. I mean, you know, and I thought, well, that ought to be time to get rid of the evidence. And so um, I get back in the Jeep, and we go back, and we're, now we're in the bright lights of a, of a, of a big squad, a big uh, hooch that was an administrative hooch. It's probably about 12 clerks working the night shift. And a, and, a, and a gunnery sergeant uh, who's, who was the night NCO duty officer. And uh, we come in with these three kids, and um, they're looking pretty cocky, right? You know? And he says, okay, are these the kids? He already heard about it. He said, yeah, the, I picked him up here, Gunny. We're going to search him right here. They, you know? And uh, so I said, okay, empty your pockets. And there's these grins on their faces. They're doing this, you know? And, Worm, I, I didn't get this right in the book because I saw him later. I said it came out of his pocket. It actually came out of the sling of, of his wounded arm, a marijuana cigarette, and it hit the floor. I mean, if you ever want to see a black kid turn white, that was the time. I mean, it was just amazing. And just the silence, and I went, and my heart sank. I mean, he's a great Marine. I mean, great kid. Automatic. Portsmouth Naval Prison, automatic dishonorable discharge for that. So I picked it up, and I'm honestly, my hands were trembling. And he's uh, on his way out of the Marines. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he's he's done his he's done his thing, you know, very well. And so I go to the gunnery sergeant, and I'm literally my hands shaking because I I don't lie normally, and I said, Gunny, this looks like tobacco to me. And he looked at me. And he looked over, and he, and, he, and he told the other two kids, get out of here, and they, they're gone. So now it's just Warner. And um, he looks around at everybody else, and he looks at, and you know these gunnery sergeants, I mean, they're actors. Right? He sniffs it, and he does this, you know, he looks at it, and he, you know, mm, you know and I thought, oh, God, you know. And he goes around to every clerk in the, in the place, and he says, what do you think? Is this marijuana or tobacco? Looks like tobacco to me, Gunny. You know, one after the other after the other, and Warner is just trembling in his boots. And so finally, the Gunny comes back and he says, "Well, Lieutenant," he says, um, "I don't know what kind of a Marine you got here, but you say he's a good one. Everybody here thinks it's tobacco. I guess it must be tobacco." And I told Warner, "Get out of here. He's gone." You know, and that, and that was it. Well. The thing is, is that for a rule that in general makes sense, you don't want people smoking dope, particularly in com combat zones, uh, there was a cultural issue about marijuana at the time. But for a rule that generally made sense, in this particular instance, there's a bigger rule, and that's, the, that's what I call compassion. And moral conflicts are often two valid moral 
things hitting at the same time. And I just chose compassion. I couldn't live with myself if I'd sent him to Portsmouth for that. Just couldn't do it. And quite frankly, I don't think anybody else in the hooch, including the gunny, could have, because he didn't. Okay. One last question, we'll go to the, the audience questions. Um, toward the very end of what is likely to go to war, you write, I'm constantly told, usually by people who have never been to war and who apply varying degrees of simplistic reasoning, that all is fair in love and war, that having rules of war is total nonsense. This is simply not true. To sink to the position that fair play and the impulses of good character have no place in modern war, taking some sort of tough guy realpolitik stance, something the ethical warrior must never do. We're about to wrap up an ethics symposium. Could you elaborate on that thought? Well, yeah, I, I can. I mean, it's, it's, there is this sort of cynicism about, well, it's war, isn't it? You know, we should just be able to do everything. I mean, um, I don't think that that's true. I mean, for example, we don't wrap uh, dynamite around our kids and send them off to, to hurt the enemy. There are, so there are, there are ethical uh, lines that we won't cross. And um, those ethical lines are there for good reasons because, you see, your behavior gives permission to the enemy to behave the same way. We have an issue with drones right now. How we're behaving with drones is giving permission to every other country in the world to start using drones the same way we are. So it's that universalizability law. If you actually say it's okay to behave this way, you are saying it's okay for you to behave that way against me. And believe me, if I was taken prisoner, I would hope to hell that I didn't have a dumb Lieutenant Marlanis on the other side saying that we're not taking prisoners today. I would want there to be an ethical standard that says once, once you've given up and you're no longer a threat, then it's murder. It's not, it's not uh, killing an enemy. Because I don't want to be treated that way. Golden rule. I mean, it, 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 it is a standard. And I think that we must maintain it in warfare. The other, the other thing is, is that how you live with yourself, these horrible things that you do, if you do those things breaking moral laws as in addition, it just it redounds on you again. I mean, you know, the Hindus would say it'll come back as karma, but it'll come back as psychological trauma, this, these, these kinds of moral wounds that you take. So there's a lot of good reasons. And, um, and I think ultimately the, there's, there's the reason that the military isn't there to kill people. It's actually there to change <coughs> people's minds. I mean, that's what we're actually trying to do. I mean, we're, we're actually trying to say, you know, we think that you're trying to behave in a way that hurts our way of life, that we value and cherish, or you're trying to hurt my family or our country. And I don't want to kill you. I want you to stop. Now, you can stop somebody by killing them, but that is not the object. I mean, Gandhi, what do you call it? Sat 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 I mean, he actually wasn't a pacifist. He told Nehru to send the army into Kashmir when the Pakistanis invaded, because he said it's a violation of our national boundaries. But his, his idea was not pacifism, but was changing people's minds. And this is just another way of changing people's minds. What you want to do is, is have a system where you do the minimal to get that accomplished. Because believe me, in, in how long was it before we were allies with Japan and Germany? Five years? And if, and if we'd have been horrible, if we'd have done things the way the Japanese did to us and our prisoners and stuff, I don't think we could have made that alliance. And I think that we have to meet people uh, as human beings as, as quickly as possible and uh, make sure that you live in a world where, where they don't want to take revenge or behave this, this in a savage way. Because you can get people to change their minds and you can actually make the world go forward better, more effectively, if you have moral rules in, in war. Okay, guys, we have a little less than half an hour, so plenty of time for some good questions. I hope they're out there. So please, don't be shy.